Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm returning to the Raspberry Pi Pico PIO Programming Project Path. Alliteration aside, I did my last PIO chronicle in April 2022, just before my cataract surgery. Since the surgery, I've converted from being extremely nearsighted to being farsighted, prepped my camper for a 10-day boondocking trip to AirVenture, which I then attended, and did numerous other summertime activities. But now it's time to get back to the bench. My last Pico video looked at implementing an arbitrary waveform generator, or AWG, using PIO. We were successful, but it was slow and difficult to use. I've got some ideas on how to make it better, so why don't you join me as we continue to improve our arbitrary waveform generator. In my previous AWG video, I used PIO to output a digital waveform to a digital to analog converter. As a review, here's the flow diagram. First, we'll generate a wavetable and store it as an array in memory. When we're ready to output the wave, we'll use direct memory access to repeatedly move data from the memory to the programmable input output. The PIO will provide the timing to send the parallel data to the GPIO pins. The GPIO pins will output digital parallel electrical signals to the digital to analog converter. The digital to analog converter combines the parallel signals into one analog signal, which is then amplified by the amplifier for use. I achieved almost 400 kHz, but at a very low amplitude. This was due in part to the low speed amplifier circuit that I used. I used an LM358 medium speed op amp with a single 5 volt power supply as the basis of the circuit. The first thing I did to increase the performance was to replace the LM358 with an LM6171 high speed op amp. I also added a split plus and minus 5 volt power supply. I got the plus 5 volt leg from the supply bus of the Pico and I modified a cheap USB cable so I could use a phone charger to get the negative 5 volt leg. I AC coupled the DAC circuit to the inverting input of the op amp and added a feedback resistor network to increase the gain to two. This was a little out of my wheelhouse since I don't do much with high speed analog circuits, but the op amp data sheet was a fountain of information. Let's try out the new amplifier circuit. The amplitude is much higher at 400 kilohertz, but what about higher frequencies? Well, I can increase the state machine clock frequency to 125 megahertz, but that only gives me a frequency of 488 kilohertz. How do I get faster than that? If you remember from my last video, the wavetable is 256 bytes long. In that table, I have one wave cycle. I transfer out one byte every state machine clock cycle so that at 125 megahertz, I can send out a complete cycle approximately every two microseconds for a frequency of 488 kilohertz. That's pretty much the maximum frequency we can get with this configuration. If I put in two wave cycles in the wavetable, I could double the frequency, albeit at a lower resolution. If I put in four cycles, I should be able to quadruple the frequency. Let's try it. I'll change the formula for the waveform. With two cycles in the wavetable, I can get to a maximum frequency of about 980 kilohertz. At four cycles per wavetable, we can achieve over 1.9 megahertz. What's the maximum frequency we can achieve? Well, 32 cycles per wavetable yields only eight samples per cycle. That's a pretty low resolution, but we can achieve 15.6 megahertz. If we push it to 64 cycles per wavetable, we can get to over 30 megahertz, but the resolution is only four samples per cycle. Let's try it out. It kind of looks like a sine wave, but if we slow the state machine clock cycle down to 2000 hertz, you can definitely see the discrete steps in the waveform. To get the best resolution of the waveform, we should strive to keep the state machine clock cycle as fast as possible resulting in fewer cycles per wave table and subsequently more samples per cycle. In the last video, we explored how PIO and DMA work together to send the data to the digital to analog converter. 
This time, I'm going to modify the program to accommodate speeds up to 15 MHz for sine, square, and triangle waves. Let's look at a simplified block diagram. Note that since the blocks in gray have already been covered in detail in my previous AWG video, I'll only concentrate on the new or modified blocks. I'll put a link in the description for all the programs I use today. First, we'll specify the libraries and programs we'll be using. This includes the PIO program, which is exactly the same as in the previous video. Here, I'll also correctly define PI, which I screwed up during the last video since I had borrowed a chunk of code where it was incorrectly defined. The next block is to initialize the variables. Here, I set the variables for the rest of the program, including the GPIO pins, the size of the wavetable, and variables that are used during the building of the wavetable. The next block is where we'll specify the waveform parameters. This includes the type of wave, including sine wave, triangle wave, and square wave, the desired frequency of our waveform, the duty cycle of the triangle and square waves. This allows us to modify the shape of the waves, including making sawtooth and pulse waves. We'll also specify the polarity of the wave. Since we are now using an inverting amplifier, this lets us correct the phase of the square and triangle waves. The next block calculates the number of cycles that will be included in the wavetable to give us the best resolution possible. It also calculates the required state machine clock frequency to achieve the desired frequency. First, we start at one cycle per waveform, the best resolution. This will work for any desired frequency below 488.3 kHz. If the desired frequency is above this 488.3 kHz, we'll double the number of cycles in the wavetable to two. This is good for any desired frequency below 976.6 kHz. In a similar manner, if the desired frequency is above 976.6 kHz, we double the number of cycles per wavetable to four. This will work up to 1.95 MHz. We continue stepping up the number of cycles per waveform until we exceed the desired frequency. The state machine clock frequency is calculated by multiplying the desired frequency by the number of samples in a single wave cycle. This is determined by dividing the number of samples in the wavetable by the number of cycles in the wavetable. Now we can fill the wavetable with the appropriate waveform. Here we have three cases, one for a sine wave, one for a triangle wave, and one for a square wave. The sine wave is pretty straightforward. Simply step through the wavetable and calculate the sine value based on the location in the wavetable. The only difference between this calculation and the one in the previous AWG video is the addition of the number of cycles in the wavetable into the equation. For the triangle wave, we set up two nested loops. The outer loop steps through the number of cycles in the wavetable. The inner loop steps through the samples for each cycle and calculates the wave cycle sampled value. I include the duty cycle and the polarity in these statements. Similarly, the square wave uses two nested loops and drives the signal high or low depending on the position in the wavetable, the duty cycle, and the polarity. Once the state machine clock frequency is determined, we can initialize the PIO and the direct memory access. I discussed this in much more detail in the previous AWG video. Finally, we can start the DMA, which starts the PIO outputting the wavetable samples to the digital to analog converter. There is another program block reserved for debugging and future enhancements. This utilizes the serial USB connection to communicate with the terminal. I started playing with adding terminal control to the AWG. However, terminal control isn't trivial, so I decided not to include it in this video. Let's choose a sine wave at frequency of 4 MHz. I'll input the waveform type and the frequency, then I'll save and compile the program. 
After it's compiled, start the Pico by holding down the Boot Select button while plugging in the USB connector. Then copy over the UF2 file into the Pico. Let's check out the waveform. Not bad, a little shaky. Let's try it with a square wave. Hmm, not so good. There's some overshoot where there's a big swing in voltage. I saw in the data sheet for the LM6171 that that could be a problem. They suggest adding a very small capacitor across the feedback resistor. After digging through my stash, I found a 3.9 picofarad capacitor which I installed, but now there's significant undershoot. I dug some more and found an unknown capacitor, but I think it's about 2 picofarads. I also added a 47 ohm resistor between the output and ground to minimize ringing. Those seem to do the trick, but I'm noticing a little frequency jitter. I investigated the jitter quite a bit more. At first, I thought it was noise on the analog side, but when I measured the digital signal, the jitter was still there. Then I thought this was because the sampling rate of my digital scope was causing some aliasing. Well, that might be true, but I noticed the jitter on my analog scope as well. The answer to the jitter is on pages 358 and 359 of the RP2040 data sheet. We're using fractional clock dividers to derive the state machine clock frequency for nearly all of the desired output frequencies. As you can see from figure 47, a fractional divisor will incorporate some jitter. As noted, the jitter can sometimes be unacceptable. A 4 MHz desired frequency requires a state machine clock frequency of 64 MHz. This is achieved by dividing the system clock frequency of 125 MHz by 1.953 or 1 plus 244256. If you run the numbers, this results in a short clock pulse about every 22 state machine clock cycles. To verify this is what's causing the jitter, Let's choose a prime frequency resulting from an integer divisor. That frequency would be 3.90625 MHz. That's the 125 MHz system clock frequency divided by the waveform size of 256 bytes times the number of cycles per wavetable, in this case 8. Notice that the waveform at this frequency is very stable. Now let's try a triangle wave at the same frequency. It looks good, so let's change the duty cycle from 0.5 to 1. That's a pretty fair sawtooth wave, and the frequency accuracy looks okay. Finally, speaking of frequency, let's run our AWG up to 15 MHz, which is the upper limit assuming a relatively paltry 8 samples per wave cycle. As you can see, the wave shapes are recognizable, but not super crisp. The jitter could be a problem. I can see where, in some circuits, a stutter in the wave period could trigger harmonics. I tried increasing the number of cycles per wavetable and decreasing the state machine clock frequency, but low resolution became a problem and I saw no improvement in the jitter. This is the problem with trying to use digital circuits with analog circuitry. They don't lend themselves to smooth curves without discontinuities. Thanks for joining me today. We sped up my Raspberry Pi Pico arbitrary waveform generator by revising the amplifier circuit and modifying the software. I was able to get a high speed waveform out, but I don't know if it'll be useful for real world applications. Frequency jitter and discrete steps in the output due to low resolution could be limiting if used for testing or troubleshooting purposes. I'm not sure where I'll go next with the Pico. I've had a couple interesting suggestions for the viewers. I've been waiting for a Raspberry Pi Pico W, but there is a very limited availability in the States. If you have anything you'd like to see, let me know. If you like this video or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in 
Life with David. See you soon.